英語聞き流しリスニング、英語テキストと MP3 音声ダウンロードはホームページからご利用いただけます。88thpp.com、88thpp.com。10. A Grandmama. The following evening, great expectation reigned in the house. Tanette had put on a new cap, Sebastian was placing footstools in front of nearly every armchair, and Miss Rottenmeyer walked with great dignity about the house, inspecting everything. When the carriage at last drove up, the servants flew downstairs, followed by Miss Rottenmeyer in more measured step. Heidi had been sent to her room to await further orders, but it was not long before Tanette opened the door and said brusquely, Go into the study. The Grandmama, With her kind and loving way, immediately befriended the child and made her feel as if she had known her always. To the housekeeper's great mortification, she called the child Heidi, remarking to Miss Rottenmeyer, If somebody's name is Heidi, I call her so. The housekeeper soon found that she had to respect the grandmother's ways and opinions. Mrs. Seesman always knew what was going on in the house the minute she entered it. On the following afternoon, Clara was resting and, and the old lady had shut her eyes for five minutes, when she got up again and went into the dining room. With a suspicion that the housekeeper was probably asleep, she went to this lady's room, knocking loudly on the door. After a while, somebody stirred inside, and with a bewildered face, Miss Rottenmeyer appeared, staring at the unexpected visitor. Rottenmeyer, where is the child? How does she pass her time? I want to know, said Mrs. Seesman. She just sits in her room, not moving a finger, she has not the slightest desire to do something useful, and that is why she thinks of such absurd things that one can hardly mention them in polite society. I should do exactly the same thing, if I were left alone like that. Please bring her to my room now, I want to show her some pretty books I have brought with me. That is just the trouble. What should she do with books? In all this time, she has not even learned the A, B, C, for it is impossible to instill any knowledge into this being. If Mr. Candidate was not as patient as an angel, he would have given up teaching her long ago. How strange! The child does not look to me like one who cannot learn the A, B, C, said Mrs. Seesman. Please fetch her now, we can look at the pictures anyway. The housekeeper was going to say more, but the old lady had turned already and gone to her room. She was thinking over what she had heard about Heidi, making up her mind to look into the matter. Heidi had come and was looking with wondering eyes at the splendid pictures in the large books that Grandmama was showing her. Suddenly she screamed aloud, for there on the picture she saw a peaceful flock grazing on a green pasture. In the middle, a shepherd was standing, leaning on his crook. The setting sun was shedding a golden light over everything. With glowing eyes, Heidi devoured the scene, but suddenly she began to sob violently. The grandmama took her little hand in hers and said in the most soothing voice, Come, child, you must not cry. Did this remind you of something? Now stop, and I'll tell you the story tonight. There are lovely stories in this book that people can read and tell. Dry your tears now, darling, I must ask you something. Stand up now and look at me. Now we are merry again. Heidi did not stop at once, but the kind lady gave her ample time to compose herself, saying from time to time, Now it's all over. Now we'll be merry again. When the child was quiet at last, she said, Tell me now how your lessons are going. What have you learnt, child, tell me? Nothing, Heidi sighed, but I knew that I never could learn it. What is it that you can't learn? I can't learn to read, it is too hard. What next? Who gave you this information? Peter told me, and he tried over and over again. But he could not do it, for it is too hard. Well, what kind of boy is he? Heidi, you must not believe what Peter tells you, but try for yourself. I am sure you had your thoughts elsewhere when Mr. Candidate showed you the letters. It's no use, Heidi said with such a tone as if she was resigned to her fate. I am going to tell you something, Heidi, said the kind lady now. You have not learned to read because you have believed what Peter said. You shall believe me now, and I prophesy that you will learn it in a very short time. As a great many other children do that are like you and not like Peter. When you can read, I am going to give you this book. You have seen the shepherd on the green pasture, and then you'll be able to find out all the strange things that happen to him. Yes, you can hear the whole story, and what he does with his sheep and his goats. You would like to know, wouldn't you, Heidi? Heidi had listened attentively, and said now with sparkling eyes, If I could only read already. It won't be long, I can see that. Come now and let us go to Clara. With that, they both went over to the study. Since the day of Heidi's attempted flight, a great change had come over the child. She had realized that it would hurt her kind friends if she tried to go home again. She knew now that she could not leave, as her Aunt Detta had promised, for they all, especially Clara and her father and the old lady, would think her ungrateful. 
but the burden grew heavier in her heart and she lost her appetite, and got paler and paler. She could not get to sleep at night from longing to see the mountains with the flowers and the sunshine, and only in her dreams she would be happy. When she woke up in the morning, she always found herself on her high white bed, far away from home. Burying her head in her pillow, she would often weep a long, long time. Mrs. Seisman had noticed the child's unhappiness, but let a few days pass by, hoping for a change. But the change never came, and often Heidi's eyes were red even in the early morning. So she called the child to her room one day and said, with great sympathy in her voice, tell me, Heidi, what is the matter with you? What is making you so sad? But as Heidi did not want to appear thankless, she replied sadly, I can't tell you. No? Can't you tell Clara perhaps? Oh, no, I can't tell anyone, Heidi said, looking so unhappy that the old lady's heart was filled with pity. I tell you something, little girl, she continued. If you have a sorrow that you cannot tell to anyone, you can go to our Father in heaven. You can tell him everything that troubles you, and if we ask him he can help us and take our suffering away. Do you understand me, child? Don't you pray every night? Don't you thank him for all his gifts and ask him to protect you from evil? Oh no, I never do that, replied the child. Have you never prayed, Heidi? Do you know what I mean? I only prayed with my first grandmother, but it is so long ago, that I have forgotten. See, Heidi, I understand now why you are so unhappy. We all need somebody to help us, and just think how wonderful it is, to be able to go to the Lord, when something distresses us and causes us pain. We can tell Him everything and ask Him to comfort us, when nobody else can do it. He can give us happiness and joy. Heidi was gladdened by these tidings, and asked, Can we tell Him everything, everything? Yes, Heidi, everything. The child, withdrawing her hand from the grandmama, said hurriedly, Can I go now? Yes, of course, was the reply, and with this Heidi ran to her room. Sitting down on a stool she folded her hands and poured out her heart to God, imploring Him to help her and let her go home to her grandfather. About a week later, Mr. Canada asked to see Mrs. Seisman, to tell her of something unusual that had occurred. Being called to the ladies' room, he began, Mrs. Seisman, something has happened that I never expected, and with many more words the happy grandmama was told that Heidi had suddenly learned to read with the utmost correctness, most rare with beginners. Many strange things happen in this world, Mrs. Seisman remarked, while they went over to the study to witness Heidi's new accomplishment. Heidi was sitting close to Clara, reading her a story, she seemed amazed at the strange, new world that had opened up before her. At supper Heidi found the large book with the beautiful pictures on her plate, and looking doubtfully at Grandmama, she saw the old lady nod. Now it belongs to you, Heidi, she said. Forever? Also when I am going home? Heidi inquired, confused with joy. Certainly, forever. The grandmama assured her. Tomorrow we shall begin to read it. But Heidi, you must not go home. No, not for many years, Clara exclaimed, especially when grandmama goes away. You must stay with me. Heidi still looked at her book before going to bed that night, and this book became her dearest treasure. She would look at the beautiful pictures and read all the stories aloud to Clara. Grandmama would quietly listen and explain something here and there, making it more beautiful than before. Heidi loved the pictures with the shepherd best of all, they told the story of the prodigal son, and the child would read and re-read it till she nearly knew it all by heart. Since Heidi had learned to read and possess the book, the day seemed to fly, and the time had come near that the grandmama had fixed for her departure. 11. Heidi gains in some respects and loses in others. The grandmama sent for Heidi every day after dinner, while Clara was resting and Miss Rottenmeier disappeared into her room. She talked to Heidi and amused her in various ways, showing her how to make clothes for pretty little dolls that she had brought. Unconsciously Heidi had learned to sew, and made now the sweetest dresses and coats for the little people out of lovely materials the grandmama would give her. Often Heidi would read to the old lady, for the oftener she read over the stories the dearer they became to her. The child lived everything through with the people in the tales and was always happy to be with them again but she never looked really cheerful and her eyes never sparkled merrily as before. In the last week of Mrs. Seisman's stay, Heidi was called again to the old lady's room. The child entered with her beloved book under her arm. Mrs. Seisman drew Heidi close to her, and laying the book aside, she said, Come, child, and tell me why you are so sad. Do you still have the same sorrow? Yes, Heidi replied. Did you confide it to our Lord? Yes. Do you pray to him every day that he may make you happy again and take your affliction away? Oh no, I don't pray any more. What do I hear, Heidi? Why don't you pray? It does not help, for God has not listened. I don't wonder, she added, for if all the people in Frankfurt pray every night, he cannot listen to them all. 
I am sure he has not heard me. Really? Why are you so sure? Because I have prayed for the same thing many, many weeks and God has not done what I have asked him to. That is not the way, Heidi. You see, God in heaven is a good father to all of us, who knows what we need better than we do. When something we ask for is not very good for us, he gives us something much better, if we confide in him and do not lose confidence in his love. I am sure what you asked for was not very good for you just now, he has heard you, for he can hear the prayers of all the people in the world at the same time, because he is God Almighty and not a mortal like us. He heard your prayers and said to himself, Yes, Heidi shall get what she is praying for in time. Now, while God was looking down on you to hear your prayers, you lost confidence and went away from him. If God does not hear your prayers any more, he will forget you also and let you go. Don't you want to go back to him, Heidi, and ask his forgiveness? Pray to him every day, and hope in him, that he may bring cheer and happiness to you. Heidi had listened attentively, she had unbounded confidence in the old lady, whose words had made a deep impression on her. Full of repentance, she said, I shall go at once and ask our father to pardon me. I shall never forget him any more. That's right, Heidi, I am sure he will help you in time, if you only trust in him, the grandmother consoled her. Heidi went to her room now and prayed earnestly to God that he would forgive her and fulfill her wish. The day of departure had come, but Mrs. Seisman arranged everything in such a way that the children hardly realized she was actually going. Still everything was empty and quiet when she had gone, and the children hardly knew how to pass their time. Next day, Heidi came to Clara in the afternoon and said, Can I always, always read to you now, Clara? Clara assented, and Heidi began. But she did not get very far, for the story she was reading told of a grandmother's death. Suddenly she cried aloud, Oh, now grandmother is dead. And wept in the most pitiful fashion. Whatever Heidi read always seemed real to her, and now she thought it was her own grandmother at home. Louder and louder she sobbed, Now poor grandmother is dead and I can never see her any more, and she never got one single roll. Clara attempted to explain the mistake, but Heidi was too much upset. She pictured to herself how terrible it would be if her dear old grandfather would die too while she was far away. How quiet and empty it would be in the hut, and how lonely she would be. Miss Rottenmeyer had overheard the scene, and approaching the sobbing child she said impatiently, Adel Hyde, now you have screamed enough. If I hear you again giving way to yourself in such a noisy fashion, I shall take your book away forever. Heidi turned pale at that, for the book was her greatest treasure. Quickly drying her tears, she choked down her sobs. After that Heidi never cried again, often she could hardly repress her sobs and was obliged to make the strangest faces to keep herself from crying out. Clara often looked at her, full of surprise, but Miss Rottenmeyer did not notice them and found no occasion to carry out her threat. However, the poor child got more cheerless every day, and looked so thin and pale that Sebastian became worried. He tried to encourage her at table to help herself to all the good dishes, but listlessly she would let them pass and hardly touch them. In the evening she would cry quietly, her heart bursting with longing to go home. Thus the time passed by. Heidi never knew if it was summer or winter, for the walls opposite never changed. They drove out very seldom, for Clara was only able to go a short distance. They never saw anything else than streets, houses and busy people, no grass, no fir trees and no mountains. Heidi struggled constantly against her sorrow, but in vain. Autumn and winter had passed, and Heidi knew that the time was coming when Peter would go up the Alp with his goats, where the flowers were glistening in the sunshine and the mountains were all afire. She would sit down in a corner of her room and put both hands before her eyes, not to see the glaring sunshine on the opposite wall. There she would remain, eating her heart away with longing, till Clara would call for her to come. 12. The Seisman House is Haunted For several days Miss Rottenmeyer had been wandering silently about the house. When she went from room to room or along the corridors, she would often glance back as if she were afraid that somebody was following her. If she had to go to the upper floor, where the gorgeous guest rooms were, or to the lower story, where the big ballroom was situated, she always told Tanette to come with her. The strange thing was, that none of the servants dared to go anywhere alone and always found an excuse to ask each other's company, which requests were always granted. The cook, who had been in the house for many years, would often shake her head and mutter, that I should live to see this. Something strange and weird was happening in the house. Every morning, when the servants came downstairs, they found the front door wide open. At first everybody had thought that the house must have been robbed, but nothing was missing. Every morning it was the same, despite the double locks that were put on the door. At last John and Sebastian, taking courage, prepared themselves to watch through a night to see who was the ghost. Armed and provided with some strengthening liquor, they repaired to a room downstairs. First they talked, but soon, getting sleepy, 
they leaned silently back in their chairs. When the clock from the old church tower struck one, Sebastian awoke and roused his comrade, which was no easy matter. At last, however, John was wide awake, and together they went out into the hall. The same moment a strong wind put out the light that John held in his hand. Rushing back, he nearly upset Sebastian, who stood behind him, and pulling the butler back into the room, he locked the door in furious haste. When the light was lit again, Sebastian noticed that John was deadly pale and trembling like an aspen leaf. Sebastian, not having seen anything, asked anxiously, What is the matter? What did you see? The door was open and a white form was on the stairs, it went up and was gone in a moment, gasped John. Cold shivers ran down the butler's back. They sat without moving till the morning came, and then, shutting the door, they went upstairs to report to the housekeeper what they had seen. The lady, who was waiting eagerly, heard the tale and immediately sat down to write to Mr. Seisman. She told him that fright had paralyzed her fingers and that terrible things were happening in the house. Then followed a tale of the appearance of the ghost. Mr. Seisman replied that he could not leave his business, and advised Miss Rottenmeyer to ask his mother to come to stay with them, for Mrs. Seisman would easily dispatch the ghost. Miss Rottenmeyer was offended with the tone of the letter, which did not seem to take her account seriously. Mrs. Seisman also replied that she could not come, so the housekeeper decided to tell the children all about it. Clara, at the uncanny tale, immediately exclaimed that she would not stay alone another moment and that she wished her father to come home. The housekeeper arranged to sleep with the frightened child, while Heidi, who did not know what ghosts were, was perfectly unmoved. Another letter was dispatched to Mr. Seisman, telling him that the excitement might have serious effects on his daughter's delicate constitution and mentioning several misfortunes that might probably happen if he did not relieve the household from this terror. This brought Mr. Seisman. Going to his daughter's room after his arrival, he was overjoyed to see her as well as ever. Clara was also delighted to see her father. What new tricks has the ghost played on you, Miss Rottenmeyer? Asked Mr. Seisman with a twinkle in his eye. It is no joke, Mr. Seisman, replied the lady seriously. I am sure you will not laugh tomorrow. Those strange events indicate that something secret and horrible has happened in this house in days gone by. Is that so? This is new to me, remarked Mr. Seisman. But will you please not suspect my venerable ancestors? Please call Sebastian, I want to speak to him alone. Mr. Seisman knew that the two were not on good terms, so he said to the butler, Come here, Sebastian, and tell me honestly, if you have played the ghost for Miss Rottenmeyer's pastime? No, upon my word, master, you must not think that, replied Sebastian frankly. I do not like it quite myself. Well, I'll show you and John what ghosts look like by day. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves, strong young men like you. Now go at once to my old friend, Dr. Classen, and tell him to come to me at nine o'clock tonight. Tell him that I came from Paris especially to consult him, and that I want him to sit up all night with me. Do you understand me, Sebastian? Yes indeed. I shall do as you say, Mr. Seisman. Mr. Seisman then went up to Clara's room to quiet and comfort her. Punctually at nine o'clock the doctor arrived. Though his hair was grey, his face was still fresh, and his eyes were lively and kind. When he saw his friend, he laughed aloud and said, Well, well, you look pretty healthy for one who needs to be watched all night. Have patience, my old friend, replied Mr. Seisman. I am afraid the person we have to sit up for will look worse, but first we must catch him. What? Then somebody underscore is underscore sick in this house. What do you mean? Far worse, doctor, far worse. A ghost is in the house. My house is haunted. When the doctor laughed, Mr. Seisman continued, I call that sympathy, I wish my friend Miss Rottenmeyer could hear you. She is convinced that an old Seisman is wandering about, expiating some dreadful deed. How did she make his acquaintance? Asked the doctor, much amused. Mr. Seisman then explained the circumstances. He said that the matter was either a bad joke which an acquaintance of the servants was playing in his absence, or it was a gang of thieves, who, after intimidating the people, would surely rob his house by and by. With these explanations they entered the room where the two servants had watched before. A few bottles of wine stood on the table and two bright candelabra shed a brilliant light. Two revolvers were ready for emergencies. They left the door only partly open, for too much light might drive the ghost away. Then, sitting down comfortably, the two men passed their time by chatting, taking a sip now and then. The ghost seems to have spied us and probably won't come today, said the doctor. We must have patience. It is supposed to come at one, replied his friend. So they talked till one o'clock. Everything was quiet, and not a sound came from the street. Suddenly the doctor raised his finger. S.H. Seisman, don't you hear something? While they both listened, the bar was unfastened, the key was turned, and the door flew open. 
Mr. Seisman seized his revolver. You are not afraid, I hope? said the doctor, getting up. Better be cautious, whispered Mr. Seisman, seizing the candelabrum in the other hand. The doctor followed with his revolver and the light, and so they went out into the hall. On the threshold stood a motionless white form, lighted up by the moon. Who is there? thundered the doctor, approaching the figure. It turned and uttered a low shriek. There stood Heidi, with bare feet and in her white nightgown, looking bewildered at the bright light and the weapons. She was shaking with fear, while the two men were looking at her in amazement. Seisman, this seems to be your little water carrier, said the doctor. Child, what does this mean? asked Mr. Seisman. What did you want to do? Why have you come down here? Pale from fright, Heidi said, I do not know. The doctor came forward now. Seisman, this case belongs to my field. Please go and sit down while I take her to bed. Putting his revolver aside, he led the trembling child upstairs. Don't be afraid, just be quiet. Everything is all right, don't be frightened. When they had arrived in Heidi's room, the doctor put the little girl to bed, covering her up carefully. Drawing a chair near the couch, he waited till Heidi had calmed down and had stopped trembling. Then taking her hand in his, he said kindly, now everything is all right again. Tell me where you wanted to go. I did not want to go anywhere, Heidi assured him, I did not go myself, only I was there all of a sudden. Really? Tell me, what did you dream? Oh, I have the same dream every night. I always think I am with my grandfather again and can hear the fir trees roar. I always think how beautiful the stars must be, and then I open the door of the hut, and oh, it is so wonderful. But when I wake up I am always in Frankfurt. Heidi had to fight the sobs that were rising in her throat. Does your back or your head hurt you, child? No, but I feel as if a big stone was pressing me here. As if you had eaten something that disagreed with you? Oh no, but as if I wanted to cry hard. So, and then you cry out, don't you? Oh no, I must never do that, for Miss Rottenmeier has forbidden it. Then you swallow it down? Yes? Do you like to be here? Oh yes, was the faint, uncertain reply. Where did you live with your grandfather? Up on the Alp. But wasn't it a little lonely there? Oh no, it was so beautiful. But Heidi could say no more. The recollection, the excitement of the night and all the restrained sorrow overpowered the child. The tears rushed violently from her eyes and she broke out into loud sobs. The doctor rose, and soothing her, said, It won't hurt to cry, you'll go to sleep afterward, and when you wake up everything will come right. Then he left the room. Joining his anxious friend downstairs, he said, Seisman, the little girl is a sleepwalker, and has unconsciously scared your whole household. Besides, she is so homesick that her little body has wasted away. We shall have to act quickly. The only remedy for her is to be restored to her native mountain air. This is my prescription, and she must go tomorrow. What, sick, a sleepwalker, and wasted away in my house? Nobody even suspected it. You think I should send this child back in this condition, when she has come in good health? No, doctor, ask everything but that. Take her in hand and prescribe for her, but let her get well before I send her back. Seisman, the doctor replied seriously, just think what you are doing. We cannot cure her with powders and pills. The child has not a strong constitution, and if you keep her here, she might never get well again. If you restore her to the bracing mountain air to which she is accustomed, she probably will get perfectly well again. When Mr. Seisman heard this he said, if that is your advice, we must act at once, this is the only way then. With these words Mr. Seisman took his friend's arm and walked about with him to talk the matter over. When everything was settled, the doctor took his leave, for the morning had already come and the sun was shining in through the door. 13. Up the ALP on a summer evening. Mr. Seisman, going upstairs in great agitation, knocked at the housekeeper's door. He asked her to hurry, for preparations for a journey had to be made. Miss Rottenmeier obeyed the summons with the greatest indignation, for it was only half past four in the morning. She dressed in haste, though with great difficulty, being nervous and excited. All the other servants were summoned likewise, and one and all thought that the master of the house had been seized by the ghost and that he was ringing for help. When they had all come down with terrified looks, they were most surprised to see Mr. Seisman fresh and cheerful, giving orders. John was sent to get the horses ready and Tanette was told to prepare Heidi for her departure while Sebastian was commissioned to fetch Heidi's aunt. Mr. Seisman instructed the housekeeper to pack a trunk in all haste for Heidi. Miss Rottenmeier experienced an extreme disappointment, for she had hoped for an explanation of the great mystery. But Mr. Seisman, evidently not in the mood to converse further, went to his daughter's room. Clara had been wakened by the unusual noises and was listening eagerly. 
her father told her of what had happened and how the doctor had ordered Heidi back to her home, because her condition was serious and might get worse. She might even climb the roof, or be exposed to similar dangers, if she was not cured at once. Clara was painfully surprised and tried to prevent her father from carrying out his plan. He remained firm, however, promising to take her to Switzerland himself the following summer, if she was good and sensible now. So the child, resigning herself, begged to Heidi's trunk packed in her room. Mr. Seisman encouraged her to get together a good outfit for her little friend. Heidi's aunt had arrived in the meantime. Being told to take her niece home with her, she found no end of excuses, which plainly showed that she did not want to do it, for Detta well remembered the uncle's parting words. Mr. Seisman dismissed her and summoned Sebastian. The butler was told to get ready for traveling with the child. He was to go to ball that day and spend the night at a good hotel which his master named. The next day the child was to be brought to her home. Listen, Sebastian, Mr. Seisman said, and do exactly as I tell you. I know the hotel and ball, and if you show my card they will give you good accommodations. Go to the child's room and barricade the windows, so that they can only be opened by the greatest force. When Heidi has gone to bed, lock the door from outside, for the child walks in her sleep and might come to harm in the strange hotel. She might get up and open the door, do you understand? Oh exclamation mark oh exclamation mark so it was she. Exclaimed the butler. Yes, it was. You are a coward, and you can tell John he is the same. Such foolish men, to be afraid. With that Mr. Seisman went to his room to write a letter to Heidi's grandfather. Sebastian, feeling ashamed, said to himself that he ought to have resisted John and found out alone. Heidi was dressed in her Sunday frock and stood waiting for further commands. Mr. Seisman called her now. Good morning, Mr. Seisman, Heidi said when she entered. What do you think about it, little one? He asked her. Heidi looked up to him in amazement. You don't seem to know anything about it, laughed Mr. Seisman. Tanette had not even told the child, for she thought it beneath her dignity to speak to the vulgar Heidi. You are going home today. Home? Heidi repeated in a low voice. She had to gasp, so great was her surprise. Wouldn't you like to hear something about it? Asked Mr. Seisman smiling. Oh yes, I should like to, said the blushing child. Good, good, said the kind gentleman. Sit down and eat a big breakfast now, for you are going away right afterwards. The child could not even swallow a morsel, though she tried to eat out of obedience. It seemed to her as if it was only a dream. Go to Clara, Heidi, till the carriage comes, Mr. Seisman said kindly. Heidi had been wishing to go, and now she ran to Clara's room, where a huge trunk was standing. Heidi, look at the things I had packed for you. Do you like them? Clara asked. There were a great many lovely things in it, but Heidi jumped for joy when she discovered a little basket with twelve round white rolls for the grandmother. The children had forgotten that the moment for parting had come, when the carriage was announced. Heidi had to get all her own treasures from her room yet. The grandmama's book was carefully packed, and the red shawl that Miss Rottenmeyer had purposely left behind. Then putting on her pretty hat, she left her room to say goodbye to Clara. There was not much time left to do so, for Mr. Seisman was waiting to put Heidi in the carriage. When Miss Rottenmeyer, who was standing on the stairs to bid farewell to her pupil, saw the red bundle in Heidi's hand, she seized it and threw it on the ground. Heidi looked imploringly at her kind protector, and Mr. Seisman, seeing how much she treasured it, gave it back to her. The happy child at parting thanked him for all his goodness. She also sent a message of thanks to the good old doctor, whom she suspected to be the real cause of her going. While Heidi was being lifted into the carriage, Mr. Seisman assured her that Clara and he would never forget her. Sebastian followed with Heidi's basket and a large bag with provisions. Mr. Seisman called out, Happy journey! And the carriage rolled away. Only when Heidi was sitting in the train did she become conscious of where she was going. She knew now that she would really see her grandfather and the grandmother again, also Peter and the goats. Her only fear was that the poor blind grandmother might have died while she was away. The thing she looked forward to most was giving the soft white rolls to the grandmother. While she was musing over all these things, she fell asleep. In ball she was roused by Sebastian, for there they were to spend the night. The next morning they started off again, and it took them many hours before they reached Meinfeld. When Sebastian stood on the platform of the station, he wished he could have traveled further in the train rather than have to climb a mountain. The last part of the trip might be dangerous, for everything seemed half-wild in this country. Looking round, he discovered a small wagon with a lean horse. A broad-shouldered man was just loading up large bags, which had come by the train. Sebastian, approaching the man, asked some information concerning the least dangerous ascent to the Alp. After a while it was settled that the man should take Heidi and her trunk to the village and see to it that somebody would go up with her from there. Not a word had escaped Heidi, 
until she now said, I can go up alone from the village. I know the road. Sebastian felt relieved, and calling Heidi to him, presented her with a heavy roll of bills and a letter for the grandfather. These precious things were put at the bottom of the basket, under the rolls, so that they could not possibly get lost. Heidi promised to be careful of them, and was lifted up to the cart. The two old friends shook hands and parted, and Sebastian, with a slightly bad conscience for having deserted the child so soon, sat down on the station to wait for a returning train. The driver was no other than the village baker, who had never seen Heidi but had heard a great deal about her. He had known her parents and immediately guessed she was the child who had lived with the Almuncle. Curious to know why she came home again, he began a conversation. Are you Heidi, the child who lived with the Almuncle? Yes. Why are you coming home again? Did you get on badly? Oh no, nobody could have got on better than I did in Frankfurt. Then why are you coming back? Because Mr. Seisman let me come. Who? Why didn't you stay? Because I would rather be with my grandfather on the Alp than anywhere on earth. You may think differently when you get there, muttered the baker. It is strange though, for she must know, he said to himself. They conversed no more, and Heidi began to tremble with excitement when she recognized all the trees on the road and the lofty peaks of the mountains. Sometimes she felt as if she could not sit still any longer, but had to jump down and run with all her might. They arrived at the village at the stroke of five. Immediately a large group of women and children surrounded the cart, for the trunk and the little passenger had attracted everybody's notice. When Heidi had been lifted down, she found herself held and questioned on all sides. But when they saw how frightened she was, they let her go at last. The baker had to tell of Heidi's arrival with the strange gentleman, and assured all the people that Heidi loved her grandfather with all her heart, let the people say what they would about him. Heidi, in the meantime, was running up the path, from time to time she was obliged to stop, for her basket was heavy and she lost her breath. Her one idea was, if only grandmother still sits in her corner by her spinning wheel exclamation mark oh, if she should have died. When the child caught sight of the hut at last, her heart began to beat. The quicker she ran, the more it beat, but at last she tremblingly opened the door. She ran into the middle of the room, unable to utter one tone, she was so out of breath. Oh God, it sounded from one corner, our Heidi used to come in like that. Oh, if I just could have her again with me before I die. Who has come? Here I am. Grandmother, here I am, shouted the child, throwing herself on her knees before the old woman. She seized her hands and arms and snuggling up to her did not for joy utter one more word. The grandmother had been so surprised that she could only silently caress the child's curly hair over and over again. Yes, yes, she said at last, this is Heidi's hair, and her beloved voice. Oh my God, I thank thee for this happiness. Out of her blind eyes big tears of joy fell down on Heidi's hand. Is it really you, Heidi? Have you really come again? Yes, yes, grandmother, the child replied. You must not cry, for I have come and will never leave you any more. Now you won't have to eat hard black bread any more for a little while. Look what I have brought you. Heidi put one roll after another into the grandmother's lap. Ah, child, what a blessing you bring to me. The old woman cried. But you are my greatest blessing yourself, Heidi. Then, caressing the child's hair and flushed cheeks, she entreated, just say one more word, that I may hear your voice. While Heidi was talking, Peter's mother arrived, and exclaimed in her amazement, Surely, this is Heidi. But how can that be? The child rose to shake hands with Brigida, who could not get over Heidi's splendid frock and hat. You can have my hat, I don't want it any more. I have my old one still, Heidi said, pulling out her old crushed straw hat. Heidi had remembered her grandfather's words to Detta about her feather hat, that was why she had kept her old hat so carefully. Brigida at last accepted the gift after a great many remonstrances. Suddenly Heidi took off her pretty dress and tied her old shawl about her. Taking the grandmother's hand, she said, Goodbye, I must go home to grandfather now, but I shall come again tomorrow. Good night, grandmother. Oh, please come again tomorrow, Heidi, implored the old woman, while she held her fast. Why did you take your pretty dress off? asked Brigida. I'd rather go to grandfather that way, or else he might not know me any more, the way you did. Brigida accompanied the child outside and said mysteriously, he would have known you in your frock, you ought to have kept it on. Please be careful, child, for Peter tells us that the uncle never says a word to anyone and always seems so angry. But Heidi was unconcerned, and saying good night, climbed up the path with the basket on her arm. The evening sun was shining down on the grass before her. Every few minutes Heidi stood still to look at the mountains behind her. Suddenly she looked back and beheld such glory as she had not even seen in her most vivid dream. The rocky peaks were flaming in the brilliant light, 
the snowfields glowed and rosy clouds were floating overhead. The grass was like an expanse of gold, and below her the valley swam in golden mist. The child stood still, and in her joy and transport tears ran down her cheeks. She folded her hands, and looking up to heaven, thanked the Lord that he had brought her home again. She thanked him for restoring her to her beloved mountains, comma, in her happiness she could hardly find words to pray. Only when the glow had subsided, was Heidi able to follow the path again. She climbed so fast that she could soon discover, first the treetops, then the roof, finally the hut. Now she could see her grandfather sitting on his bench, smoking a pipe. Above the cottage the fir trees gently swayed and rustled in the evening breeze. At last she had reached the hut, and throwing herself in her grandfather's arms, she hugged him and held him tight. She could say nothing but grandfather. 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 In her agitation. The old man said nothing either, but his eyes were moist, and loosening Heidi's arms at last, he sat her on his knee. When he had looked at her a while, he said, So you have come home again, Heidi? Why? You certainly do not look very citified. Did they send you away? Oh no, you must not think that, Grandfather. They all were so good to me, Clara, Mr. Seisman and Grandma. But Grandfather, sometimes I felt as if I could not bear it any longer to be away from you. I thought I should choke, I could not tell anyone, for that would have been ungrateful. Suddenly, one morning Mr. Seisman called me very early, I think it was the doctor's fault in, but I think it is probably written in this letter. With that Heidi brought the letter and the bankroll from her basket, putting them on her Grandfather's lap. This belongs to you, he said, laying the roll beside him. Having read the letter, he put it in his pocket. Do you think you can still drink milk with me, Heidi? He asked, while he stepped into the cottage. Take your money with you, you can buy a bed for it and clothes for many years. I don't need it at all, grandfather, Heidi assured him. I have a bed and Clara has given me so many dresses that I shan't need any more all my life. Take it and put it in the cupboard, for you will need it some day. Heidi obeyed and danced around the hut in her delight to see all the beloved things again. Running up to the loft, she exclaimed in great disappointment, Oh grandfather, my bed is gone. It will come again, the grandfather called up from below, How could I know that you were coming back? Get your milk now. Heidi, coming down, took her old seat. She seized her bowl and emptied it eagerly, as if it was the most wonderful thing she had ever tasted. Grandfather, our milk is the best in all the world. Suddenly Heidi, hearing a shrill whistle, rushed outside, as Peter and all his goats came racing down. Heidi greeted the boy, who stopped, rooted to the spot, staring at her. Then she ran into the midst of her beloved friends, who had not forgotten her either. Schwanli and Barley bleated for joy, and all her other favorites pressed near to her. Heidi was beside herself with joy, and caressed little Snowhopper and patted Thistlefinch, till she felt herself pushed to and fro among them. Peter, why don't you come down and say goodnight to me? Heidi called to the boy. Have you come again? He exclaimed at last. Then he took Heidi's proffered hand and asked her, as if she had been always there, Are you coming up with me tomorrow? No, tomorrow I must go to grandmother, but perhaps the day after. Peter had a hard time with his goats that day, for they would not follow him. Over and over again they came back to Heidi, till she entered the shed with Barley and Schwanli and shut the door. When Heidi went up to her loft to sleep, she found a fresh, fragrant bed waiting for her, and she slept better that night than she had for many, many months, for her great and burning longing had been satisfied. About ten times that night the grandfather rose from his couch to listen to Heidi's quiet breathing. The window was filled up with hay, for from now on the moon was not allowed to shine on Heidi any more. But Heidi slept quietly, for she had seen the flaming mountains and had heard the fir trees roar. 14. On Sunday when the church bells ring. Heidi was standing under the swaying fir trees, waiting for her grandfather to join her. He had promised to bring up her trunk from the village while she went in to visit the grandmother. The child was longing to see the blind woman again and to hear how she had liked the rolls. It was Saturday and the grandfather had been cleaning the cottage. Soon he was ready to start. When they had descended and Heidi entered Peter's hut, the grandmother called lovingly to her, Have you come again, child? She took hold of Heidi's hand and held it tight. Grandmother then told the little visitor how good the rolls had tasted, and how much stronger she felt already. Brigitte related further that the grandmother had only eaten a single roll, being so afraid to finish them too soon. Heidi had listened attentively, and said now, Grandmother, I know what I shall do. I am going to write to Clara and she'll surely send me a whole lot more. But Brigitte remarked, That is meant well, but they get hard so soon. If I only had a few extra pennies, I could buy some from our baker. He makes them too, but I am hardly able to pay for the black bread. Heidi's face suddenly shone. Oh, Grandmother, I have an awful lot of money, she cried. 
Now I know what I'll do with it. Every day you must have a fresh roll and two on Sundays. Peter can bring them up from the village. No, no, child, the grandmother implored. That must not be. You must give it to grandfather and he'll tell you what to do with it. But Heidi did not listen but jumped gaily about the little room, calling over and over again, now grandmother can have a roll every day. She'll get well and strong, and, she called with fresh delight, maybe your eyes will see again, too, when you are strong and well. The grandmother remained silent, not to mar the happiness of the child. Seeing the old imp book on the shelf, Heidi said, Grandmother, shall I read you a song from your book now? I can read quite nicely. She added after a pause. Oh yes, I wish you would, child. Can you really read? Heidi, climbing on a chair, took down the dusty book from a shelf. After she had carefully wiped it off, she sat down on a stool. What shall I read, grandmother? Whatever you want to, was the reply. Turning the pages, Heidi found a song about the sun, and decided to read that aloud. More and more eagerly she read, while the grandmother, with folded arms, sat in her chair. An expression of indescribable happiness shone in her countenance, though tears were rolling down her cheeks. When Heidi had repeated the end of the song a number of times, the old woman exclaimed, Oh, Heidi, everything seems bright to me again and my heart is light. Thank you, child, you have done me so much good. Heidi looked enraptured at the grandmother's face, which had changed from an old, sorrowful expression to a joyous one. She seemed to look up gratefully, as if she could already behold the lovely, celestial gardens told of in the hymn. Soon the grandfather knocked on the window, for it was time to go. Heidi followed quickly, assuring the grandmother that she would visit her every day now. On the day she went up to the pasture with Peter, she would return in the early afternoon, for she did not want to miss the chance to make the grandmother's heart joyful and light. Brigida urged Heidi to take her dress along, and with it on her arm the child joined the old man and immediately told him what had happened. On hearing of her plan to purchase rolls for the grandmother every day, the grandfather reluctantly consented. At this the child gave a bound, shouting, Oh grandfather, now grandmother won't ever have to eat hard, black bread anymore. Oh, everything is so wonderful now. If God our Father had done immediately what I prayed for, I should have come home at once and could not have brought half as many rolls to grandmother. I should not have been able to read either. Grandmama told me that God would make everything much better than I could ever dream. I shall always pray from now on, the way Grandmama taught me. When God does not give me something I pray for, I shall always remember how everything has worked out for the best this time. We'll pray every day, Grandfather, won't we, for otherwise God might forget us. And if somebody should forget to do it? murmured the old man. Oh, he'll get on badly, for God will forget him, too. If he is unhappy and wretched, people don't pity him, for they will say, he went away from God, and now the Lord, who alone can help him, has no pity on him. Is that true, Heidi? Who told you so? Grandmama explained it all to me. After a pause the grandfather said, yes, but if it has happened, then there is no help, nobody can come back to the Lord, when God has once forgotten him. But grandfather, everybody can come back to him, Grandmama told me that, and besides there is the beautiful story in my book. Oh grandfather, you don't know it yet, and I shall read it to you as soon as we get home. The grandfather had brought a big basket with him, in which he carried half the contents of Heidi's trunk, it had been too large to be conveyed up the steep ascent. Arriving at the hut and setting down his load, he had to sit beside Heidi, who was ready to begin the tale. With great animation Heidi read the story of the prodigal son, who was happy at home with his father's cows and sheep. The picture showed him leaning on his staff, watching the sunset. Suddenly he wanted to have his own inheritance, and be able to be his own master. Demanding the money from his father, he went away and squandered all. When he had nothing in the world left, he had to go as servant to a peasant, who did not own fine cattle like his father, but only swine, his clothes were rags, and for food he only got the husks on which the pigs were fed. Often he would think what a good home he had left, and when he remembered how good his father had been to him in his own ungratefulness, he would cry from repentance and longing. Then he said to himself, I shall go to my father and ask his forgiveness. When he approached his former home, his father came out to meet him what do you think will happen now? Heidi asked. You think that the father is angry and will say, didn't I tell you? But just listen, and his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again, he was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry. Isn't it a beautiful story, grandfather? asked Heidi, 
when he sat silently beside her. Yes, Heidi, it is, said the grandfather, but so seriously that Heidi quietly looked at the pictures. Look how happy he is, she said, pointing to it. A few hours later, when Heidi was sleeping soundly, the old man climbed up the ladder. Placing a little lamp beside the sleeping child, he watched her a long, long time. Her little hands were folded and her rosy face looked confident and peaceful. The old man now folded his hands and said in a low voice, while big tears rolled down his cheeks, Father, I have sinned against heaven and thee, and am no more worthy to be thy son. The next morning found the uncle standing before the door, looking about him over valley and mountain. A few early bells sounded from below and the birds sang their morning anthems. Re-entering the house, he called, Heidi, get up. The sun is shining. Put on a pretty dress, for we are going to church. That was a new call, and Heidi obeyed quickly. When the child came downstairs in her smart little frock, she opened her eyes wide. Oh, grandfather, she exclaimed, I have never seen you in your Sunday coat with the silver buttons. Oh, how fine you look. The old man, turning to the child, said with a smile, you look nice, too, come now. With Heidi's hand in his they wandered down together. The nearer they came to the village, the louder and richer the bells resounded. Oh grandfather, do you hear it? It seems like a big, high feast, said Heidi. When they entered the church, all the people were singing. Though they sat down on the last bench behind, the people had noticed their presence and whispered it from ear to ear. When the pastor began to preach, his words were a loud thanksgiving that moved all his hearers. After the service the old man and the child walked to the parsonage. The clergyman had opened the door and received them with friendly words. I have come to ask your forgiveness for my harsh words, said the uncle. I want to follow your advice to spend the winter here among you. If the people look at me askance, I can't expect any better. I am sure, Mr. Pastor, you will not do so. The pastor's friendly eyes sparkled, and with many a kind word he commended the uncle for this change, and putting his hand on Heidi's curly hair, ushered them out. Thus the people, who had been all talking together about this great event, could see that their clergyman shook hands with the old man. The door of the parsonage was hardly shut, when the whole assembly came forward with outstretched hands and friendly greetings. Great seemed to be their joy at the old man's resolution, some of the people even accompanied him on his homeward way. When they had parted at last, the uncle looked after them with his face shining as with an inward light. Heidi looked up to him and said, Grandfather, you have never looked so beautiful. Do you think so, child? He said with a smile. You see, Heidi, I am more happy than I deserve, to be at peace with God and men makes one's heart feel light. God has been good to me, to send you back. When they arrived at Peter's hut, the grandfather opened the door and entered. How do you do, grandmother, he called out. I think we must start to mend again, before the fall wind comes. Oh my God, the uncle, exclaimed the grandmother in joyous surprise. How happy I am to be able to thank you for what you have done, uncle. Thank you. God bless you for it. With trembling joy the grandmother shook hands with her old friend. There is something else I want to say to you, uncle, she continued. If I have ever hurt you in any way, do not punish me. Do not let Heidi go away again before I die. I cannot tell you what Heidi means to me. So saying, she held the clinging child to her. No danger of that, grandmother, I hope we shall all stay together now for many years to come. Brigitte now showed Heidi's feather hat to the old man and asked him to take it back but the uncle asked her to keep it, since Heidi had given it to her. What blessings this child has brought from Frankfurt, Brigitte said. I often wondered if I should not send our little Peter to. What do you think, uncle? The uncle's eyes sparkled with fun, when he replied, I am sure it would not hurt Peter, nevertheless I should wait for a fitting occasion before I sent him. The next moment Peter himself arrived in great haste. He had a letter for Heidi, which had been given to him in the village. What an event, a letter for Heidi. They all sat down at the table while the child read it aloud. The letter was from Clara Seisman, who wrote that everything had got so dull since Heidi left. She said that she could not stand it very long, and therefore her father had promised to take her to Regatz this coming fall. She announced that Grandmama was coming too, for she wanted to see Heidi and her grandfather. Grandmama, having heard about the rolls, was sending some coffee, too, so that the grandmother would not have to eat them dry. Grandmama also insisted on being taken to the grandmother herself when she came on her visit. Great was the delight caused by this news, and what with all the questions and plans that followed, the grandfather himself forgot how late it was. This happy day, which had united them all, caused the old woman to say at parting, the most beautiful thing of all, though, is to be able to shake hands again with an old friend, as in days gone by, it is a great comfort to find again, what we have treasured. I hope you'll come soon again, uncle. 
I am counting on the child for tomorrow. This promise was given. While Heidi and her grandfather were on their homeward path, the peaceful sound of evening bells accompanied them. At last they reached the cottage, which seemed to glow in the evening light. 物語の続きはホームページからお聞きいただけます。またテキスト MP3 ダウンロードも合わせてご利用ください。88thpp.com 88thpp.com 88thpp.com